I didn't uh, let you know about or, or update you on, a and that is that Belinda is um, currently in the hospital, although she sometimes gets a little bit of time out <laughs> for good behavior, I guess, on the weekend. Um, but she is, for those of you who didn't know, she is pregnant, um, and um, her water broke early, um, and so she is in the hospital sort of on bed rest to try to keep mom and baby together for as long as possible so that all the development can happen as best as possible. Um, they did reach 32 weeks just uh, this past week, um, and so that is good, but we'd like even more. Um, so um, just pray for Belinda, and then of course pray for, pray for John and the other kids as well, um, and uh, all that is going on there. Um, now, as I mentioned, uh, today is Christ the King Sunday, and so this morning we are going to look at Matthew chapter 25, Matthew chapter 25, verses uh, 36 to 41, or 31 to 46, 31 to 46, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. Six. And uh, this passage, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit, but this passage for me has always been a little bit of a challenging passage, um, but we'll unpack that a little bit as we go along. Pay attention, however, uh, as we read this passage to the sovereignty of Christ our King and how he is truly our Lord. This is um, the parable or the story of the sheep and the goats. It's not really a parable uh, because it's not really a, 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 a sort of fictional story that tells a moral, but instead it is Jesus recounting um, what it will be like when, uh, when the Son of Man, when Jesus returns again to this earth. This is what Jesus says. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come. You who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, <clears throat> excuse me, I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The word of the Lord. 
Amen. Amen. Well, I will confess with you that um, I do struggle with this passage a little bit, but there is also, well, that's my issue, I guess, <laughs> and not really yours. Um, but there are reasons why people struggle with this. Of course, it is the Word of God, and so ultimately it has authority over us. And my struggles or your struggles are uh, easily trumped by the sovereignty of God. And so we need to humbly submit to whatever teachings are held in Scripture. And we need to humbly seek to examine um, so that we understand what God is saying to us. But first of all, we need to know that there are some differing opinions as to what this passage is speaking about precisely. Particularly, when Jesus talks about whatever you do to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, there is some debate among theologians and scholars as to exactly who Jesus is referring to when he says, the least of these. Sort of the broadest interpretation would be that Jesus is speaking about uh, all, any, any person, any human being. That when Jesus says, whatever you do to anyone who is hungering or thirsting or in prison or sick or struggling, those, whatever you do to them, you are in a sense doing to God. Or whatever you don't do um, to them or for them, you are not doing for God. Uh, another interpretation is that Jesus is very specifically referring to um, his own disciples, not just like the 12 apostles or anything like that, but to all Christ followers. And so he is saying to the world, Jesus in this passage, that whatever the world does to us um, will be part of the measuring stick for how they are judged by God, by Jesus when he comes again. Whatever you do to a Christ follower. Um, so in other words, if you are persecuting Christ followers, these brothers and sisters of mine, uh, then that is that indicates something um, that that Christ will very much look down or look askance at, look badly on, right? Another interpretation is that Jesus is speaking specifically about Jewish people, that these are the children of God that he is referring to, and that whatever people do to Jewish people, um, that is what it will be like for them on the judgment day. Now, my understanding, and, and I, as I was looking at this, I think that the best interpretation, the one that fits most accurately with the overall sense of who Jesus is and what he taught us, is that it applies to all people, right? Right? Uh, which includes disciples of Christ and includes the Jewish people, that whatever we do to any human being is, is in a sense, what we do to Jesus. Um, I think that certainly a strong case can be made that God, Jesus himself, makes it very clear that how we treat any of his image bearers is extremely important. We can see that in the parable of the Good Samaritan, for example, where the answer to the question, who is my neighbor, is everybody, including your enemy. Right? We can see that over and over again throughout scriptures when the scriptures through the prophets and so on admonish us to care for the widow and the orphan and the stranger among us. Right? God's admonition is not just to care for certain subsets of people, but to care for 
everyone. However, I wanted to be honest and open with you that that is a bit of a matter for debate among scholars as to which particular interpretation that has. Nonetheless, of course, regardless of which particular interpretation this passage has, it is very clear in the scriptures that we are indeed to treat all people with the love of of God. And so that is clear from the Bible. What is troublesome or was troublesome to me, what I struggled with, is the question of how this appears to make it all about what you do. That you will either get into eternal salvation and heaven because you have done good things, or you will receive eternal punishment because you have done bad things. Which is another way of saying that your salvation is all about your works. A works-based salvation, which is, which is very, very contrary to what the Reformers said, and it is very, very contrary to what we just read, for example, um, for our words of assurance from 1 Corinthians. And it is very contrary to what we read in many places in Scripture, where we read basically that salvation is not not through what we do, but through Christ alone. Romans, for example, talks about how all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that no one, no one can earn salvation. So what do we do? Do we earn our way into the kingdom of God by doing good things, especially good things to the poor and the needy and the oppressed and the sick and the, the, the prisoner? Is that how we get into heaven, by doing those good things? Or do we believe what other scriptures say, that our salvation is only through Jesus Christ by grace alone? What do we do? This is where... The struggle comes in. However, we need to understand that a tree bears fruit according to its kind. Do any of you have apple trees on your property? No? Yes? Some? Yeah? Good. I know that um, Henry uh, Imadajemu um, and Stefania, they have a, a, at least one apple tree. And I was there, oh, a year or so ago when it was, the fruit was on it. And there were so many apples. It was astonishing. Like, we had an apple tree or two when I was a kid in our, in our um, yard. But I don't think our apple trees ever had nearly as much fruit as went on this thing. And it was a huge apple tree, gargantuan. And it bore so much fruit. And, and that's fantastic, uh, although it's a lot of work if you, uh, you know, want to use all those apples and or you want to avoid the bees that are all over the place because of the apples that are on the ground. Uh, it can be, excuse me, a lot of work. But a tree bears fruit according to its kind. And this is extremely important when understanding the relationship between what we do and salvation. You see, we always have to interpret Scripture, the Bible, in the light of other Scriptures. And so we know that Scripture, because it does not contradict itself, it cannot contradict itself, that somehow the problem, if we look at this passage, is not with Jesus and what he's saying, but it is with us and our struggle between grace and works. And so there must be a way that these work together. 
And what Jesus is saying here is that when Jesus returns as the sovereign king in all of his glory with all of his angels to judge the living and the dead, he will do so with the keen perception of the righteous and sovereign king who sees through every artifice, who sees to the very hearts and souls of people, who knows all that they have done and who knows what lies in the secret places. You'll notice that Jesus' discernment as the Son of Man, the sovereign returning king, is highlighted in here because both the sheep and the goats, they don't really realize or they don't seem to really realize what they have done or not done. They both claim ignorance. Lord, when did we see you needing these things and do them? Or when did we see you needing these things and not do them. Now, it could be that those who are goats in this are lying, but certainly the people who have done the good things, they're perplexed almost. You see, Jesus sees right through them with laser eyes that pierce to the very heart of them. And that is key that the sovereign king sees all and knows all. But then also it is true that Jesus, being the sovereign king who sees all, sees not just what people profess with their mouths, but also what they do with their hands and their feet, even if it is in secret. Jesus sees it all. And Jesus sees whether you are an apple tree bearing apple fruit or whether you are someone pretending to be an apple tree and bearing no fruit. Or someone who should be an apple tree, who is an apple tree, but refuses to bear fruit. And this is where we come into an understanding of salvation. It used to be when I was a kid, we would, when I was a teenager, we would go to like youth rallies and so on and so forth. And we would get there and there would be like, uh, it was a like convention or all Ontario or whatever you were going to acquire. The fire is one that I went to. You would go there and there would be, uh, you know, great music and there would be great speakers who were super inspirational and so on. And they would always have an altar call at the end and they would invite people to come down and give their lives to the Lord. And then that would be it. Come, pray the prayer, give your life to Jesus. Excellent. All right. Excellent. We put a bunch of notches in our, on our wall. We saved so many people. Great. Good. Excellent. Now they go home and we do nothing with them. And they're just left on their own to do whatever. As if the only thing that mattered in salvation was praying a prayer to give your life to Jesus and then everything else in your life could go on the same as it always has. That's baloney. Jesus does not want a one-time prayer where you give your life to Jesus and that's it. You've got to become the apple tree that bears the apple fruit. And if you don't bear the fruit, <laughs> chances are really good that you're faking being an apple tree. That you didn't really receive salvation through Jesus Christ at all. Because if you did, it would make a difference. Jesus claims us all 
in and out totally and completely. Jesus will not be satisfied with some mouthed words, however sincere at the time, that make no difference for the rest of our lives. It needs to make a difference, and it needs to make a difference in the way that we treat those who are the most vulnerable in our world. And if it doesn't make a difference, then something is very seriously wrong. If I'm not helping the widow or the orphan or the sick or the prisoner or the person without clothes or, or whatever, if I'm not helping the hungry or thirsty, then I am probably not a Christ follower. It's unnatural, contrary to nature, to have a Christ follower who doesn't do those good things. In fact, and Jesus can see into the heart where I cannot, but Jesus is saying here that basically it is impossible. And so here's a hard question. And it's a question that even the sheep in this story find difficult to answer. Are you? Am I? Helping the sick, the sorrowing, the hungry, the thirsty, the poor, the prisoner? Am I? Are you? If we're not, then who are we? Are we people masquerading as apple trees? Because if I'm not bearing any of that fruit of help for those people, then am I really saved? Now, we have to be careful. We have to be careful. Because there have been Christ followers who have, in a mistaken effort to be humble, who have refused to acknowledge that they are trying to serve God and serve the, the weak and the vulnerable. They have done so many things to help the widow and the orphan and the poor and the prisoner and the sick. They have done so many things and yet they say, oh, I'm, I'm so terrible. I, 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 don't, I don't think I'm an apple tree. God also calls for an honest self-evaluation, right? And that's not to pat yourself on the back. That's not to sit there and go, oh, yeah, I'm super Christian. But instead to say, okay, self-assessment. Am I, am I living the life that God calls me to live? Chances are really not totally. We've got a ways to go, got things to do, got where areas to grow in. But chances also are that you can see, if you're really honest with yourself, ways in which the Holy Spirit is moving you to do good things in this world, to help the poor and the sick and the needy and the prisoner. God is prompting you to do those things, and you do those things because you are really, truly an apple tree. Maybe there's not as much fruit on your branches as there could be, 
And, and probably that is true, but God is working in you and God will continue to do so. And when you come before the throne of God, he will put you in the category of the sheep and he will say to you, thank you for doing those things. And you will say, okay, God, I got to be honest here. I feel like I did not do those things nearly as much as I should and certainly not enough to earn your approval. And God will say, oh, but you did do them. Because you are my child and you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And because of my grace, both in, in salvation through Jesus Christ and my grace in giving you my Holy Spirit and helping you to go along, you will have done good things. And so you will be welcomed into God's kingdom. Brothers and sisters, we need to show, not for our own sakes, not for our own glory, but we need to show the love of God by serving the poor and the needy, the prisoner, the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger. We need to do it. We need to live lives that are not just empty words. And in doing so, we will show the Lord and Savior that we are truly his sheep, as if he didn't know. And we will further spread his kingdom, for he is our sovereign God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so very much that you are our King and Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you will help us, that you will enable us to live more and more as sheep in this story that we would be apple trees that would bear much fruit and that that fruit would be your mercy and love to those particularly vulnerable and in need. Lord, we long for the day when you will return. And Lord, we long to hear those words Come to the kingdom prepared for you. Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Help us, O oh God. Help us, O oh God, not only so that we may be those sheep more and more in every day, but also so that there may be more and more sheep. Father, we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll invite uh, Diane and Karen to come forward again, and uh, we will we'll praise the Lord with By the Sea of Crystal.